When we purchase real estate, it's not so much the ground and building we acquire, but rights to do certain things with them. And that concept of rights is the beginning point in understanding the nature of real property. Developed societies involve rights, which govern acceptable behavior. Basically, rights are something that the government is obligated to protect for you. You have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if one of those things is taken away from you by another, the government will step in and restore it or serve justice for the wrong done. You have the right to free speech. These are things that can't be taken away from you, but sometimes can be curtailed or limited in certain settings if your actions can adversely affect others. The rights you're most familiar with, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, these are rights for which you are guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. But owning property in the United States comes with rights too. So, for example, you have the right, the sole right, to possess it, uh, meaning you can prevent any others from using it if that's what you wish. That's a right enforced in our society. You have the right of use, which means either living in it, renting it out to someone, harvesting crops from it if it's land, that sort of thing. And then you have the right to sell it demolish it, and so forth, again, as long as that action doesn't harm others. You know, for instance, if knocking your own building down knocks over nearby buildings or whatever, that's that'd be a no-no. But while we tend to think um, about property rights with respect to the structure, if we own a building, we can rent it out or sell it, etc., property rights go deeper than that. You may separately or in combination with your rights for that building, own the right to dig underneath or even build higher than what it currently is now. And that right to dig underneath or utilize the soil in a productive way, that's called mineral rights. Not all purchases of land and structure actually include mineral rights, and that's something that's usually spelled out in the deed, which we'll take, uh, take a look at later. But overall, when we talk about property rights, we're talking about real estate rights. It's just that those rights are broader than what we often think of because re uh, property rights can incorporate a lot of different potential uses. Here's a visual depiction of that. In the middle, you see the house. That's the property rights we're often accustomed to. But separately or together, you also have subsurface rights, like mining for minerals underneath the land, and airspace rights, which includes the right to build higher than what your current structure has, or even to sell that right to build higher to someone else who wants to build higher on a separate property entirely. Air rights can get weird like that. So for example, on the left you see the old US Postal Service building in Rincon Hill, which is now in the downtown area called the East Cut. You can see it's a low-rise building, and technically they could build higher. And then on the right, you have the Salesforce Tower, which was to be built as the tallest tower in the city. That tower height, though, breached city restrictions on building height. And so in, in, in order to build that high, the developers of the Salesforce Tower actually bought some of the air rights from the old Rincon Hill post office and then transferred those air rights to their own property. That limited the future height of the post office building and what it could be developed to if developers decide to redevelop it, but the owners of that postal building got quite a bit of money for selling those air rights to Salesforce. Fixtures are another unique concept to real estate. This is sort of like personal property that ends up becoming real property. 
The way that it becomes real property is when that personal property is affixed or put permanently in place to the property. This picture, I think, more clearly illustrates the concept. On the right, you have cabinets, which are a fixture and thus real property because basically they're not going anywhere. They're drilled into the wall and ground. The fridge to the left, on the other hand, that can be moved. It's not attached and is therefore personal property. Fixtures generally convey to the buyer when a sale occurs, but defining a picture can, a fixture can, can sometimes get complex. And so you have to be careful and specify these things in the sales contract. If there's a particular fixture on the property that you're concerned about. Um, back in the days of Amazon, uh, before the days of Amazon, AWS and Google Cloud and, and Microsoft Azure and all these other cloud providers, for example, selling computing power and, and web hosting space was more of a mom and pop business. Just to kind of give you an example of fixtures, a, a former business partner of mine used to run one of these businesses. And after he sold a building containing a bunch of his servers, the new buyer successfully sued to have the servers included back on the real estate deal at no extra cost, just because those servers were affixed to the walls on server racks. But, you know, on the other side, my, my business partner had assumed that during the sale that the computers were personal property, and so it didn't bother to mention them in the sale contract. He thought it was kind of obvious that these were personal property, but the judge disagreed and it, and it ended up being a big loss for him. I don't know if that would legally fly today, as a judge handling this case might have like a better sense of what servers are in this day and era, but... Nevertheless, it's a cautionary tale about what exactly defines the term fixture when you're buying and selling commercial property. I think, um, you know, if something has the potential to be ambiguous just about whether it's a, a fixture or not, just define it in, in the sales contract. Okay, so um, here's another look at fixtures pretty much everything you see here would be a fixture except for those products that you see sitting in the window of a stores. But it's good to specify these things in the sales contract to avoid misunderstanding. Moving on, um, so we can think about property as being a bundle of interests. When you own a property, you may only um, own surface rights to put a building on it, or you may also own mineral rights, that sort of thing. You may own the whole bundle, in other words, or you may just have only a single log. So these kind of whole bundle examples I've given so far relate to possessory interests. You have the right to use and sell, for example. But it's important to note that there are also real estate rights called non-possessory interests. These types of uh, non-possessory interests are called easements, covenants, and liens. And we'll talk about these three in just a bit. First though, let's talk about possessory interests, specifically one called fee simple. This is the most uh, complete type of ownership. If you own something fee simple, you basically own it outright and can do whatever you want with it. As long as you continue to pay your property taxes, you don't violate any lo local laws, that sort of thing. Um, fee simple conditional is similar, but as you might guess, it has conditions attached. These are less common, but an example of ownership under fee simple might be like, you can do anything with this property that you want when you own it, but you can't make it into a bar to sell alcohol, for example. If you try to convert it into a bar selling alcohol, it, it, it then conditionally, it, it then reverts back to the original seller and you lose your property. That's like the condition. It's, own, it's owned by you subject to this condition, which if you do it, reverts back to the original owner. They're kind of rare, fee simple conditionals, um, but they can happen in retail properties. That's where the pretty much the only place I've seen it occur, where the seller might have 
like a competing business nearby. So then they sell it under the condition that you can't do X with it, where X is some sort of competing type of business. So laundromats are the classic example of this. Life estate is more of a residential form of fee simple conditional. And the way this typically plays out is that you have like a married couple or legal domestic partnership. They live in a house together and one of the spouse dies. Um, a life estate on the property would mean that the, the house might go to the descendants, but not until the remaining spouse dies. So in the meantime, the surviving spouse gets to occupy the property and, and doesn't get kicked out. So that would be like a, a life estate with a remainder interest. The remainder would be those descendants, um, but the surviving spouse gets the life estate in, until then. Tenancy for years is another type of possessory interest, and it just means that there's a specified time you can occupy this property. It's like a fancy way of saying a rental contract, basically. If you're a renter and your contract is in writing, you have a, a legal real estate interest called tenancy for years. If you don't have a written rental contract, you should probably think about getting one, but that type of thing is instead called periodic tenancy. This being um, San Francisco and California, there are a lot of local and regional regulations surrounding these two types of possessory interests. So we'll dig into those in a little while. And um, as promised, we're now going to talk about non-possessory interests. So these are real estate interests you may have not had formal exposure to before, although I guarantee you will have encountered examples of them in real life. So these are easements liens and restrictive covenants, and we'll talk about each in turn. First, easements. This is the right to use land for a specific and limited purpose. I can think of no better example of an easement than that which my uncle has for his property out in the woods uh, north of Humboldt County. His property is outlined in that yellow box there, and he owns everything inside of that. But the only problem is that it's totally surrounded by land by a timber company, owned by a timber company. And there's no public road for my uncle to access his property. So instead, what he owns is an easement to build uh, and use a road running through the timber, properties, prop, uh, t timber company's property so that he can access and drive to his own house. In this case, he doesn't pay for it and it's recorded in the county, so it's all legal and forever in effect and stuff. But this easement, he owns it. It's, it's a real estate interest, the right to use a, a, a road on another person's property. He doesn't possess that road or the land that it's on, so that's why it's called a non-possessory interest, but he does possess the right to use it forever. By the way, it's the, it's the coolest winding road ever. I only have one blurry picture on the right uh, driving in a Jeep that you see there, but it's like driving through a Jurassic Park movie or something. All these ferns. Okay, but that example of my uncle's road is something called a, a dominant easement interest because it's an ownership interest that controls use of another's property. The timber company's land that land, which we often call parcel, by the way, is what's called a servient parcel in this easement, servient land. It's also an example of an affirmative easement because my uncle has a, like a right to do something affirmative. In this case, a right-of-way road on another's property. And by contrast, an example of negative easement might be found in San Francisco where perhaps a building is prevented from rising further in height because it would restrict light and air of nearby properties. That would be a, a negative easement. You cannot do this. Often um, with easements of either types like this, when they're registered with local governments, you'll see uh, the language in that registration, quote, runs with the land, end quote. And that means that easement still exists, even if the property is sold or if the properties involved change use, uh, like from being, oh, I don't know, retail to office. 
uh, or just didn't change in terms of being developed. The easement sticks around. Here's another um, visual example of an easement. Actually, a number of, of easements, but here, well, yeah, here, here you'll see an example of a driveway easement where one property has the right to have a driveway on another's property so that they can access their own. And the parcel or land, which is encumbered by that driveway, that's the servient parcel. By the way, um, when I took the California real estate license exam some years back, all these easement definitions ended up being on the exam. So um, it's worth memorizing these terms if you think you're going to sit for that. There's also this thing called easement in gross. You can think of the word gross here being related to its use as a word for something general. Gross meaning general. Something general in nature. So an easement in gross is something that's an easement in general and not always specific to any one parcel. The example of this might be rights to access irrigation water along a canal the right given to someone to access property or properties just for the use of hunting and fishing, like some specific activity, or an easement for uh, laying electrical cables underneath a number of parcels by a utility company like PG&E. Those are all easements and gross. Um, easements and gross can uh, be either exclusive or non-exclusive, meaning that the, either the owner of that easement can transfer it to others, or if instead it's, it's applicable only to them. So I once worked with someone who had an easement in gross to ride their horses on another person's ranch property, for example. It was a non-exclusive easement because the easement stipulated only they could bring their horses. They couldn't, for example, start a horse riding business and have big groups of people going along the property every day and in tours or whatever. And actually that's in fact what they tried to do and it's uh, why it ended up in litigation, but that's a story for another day. Okay, so, so this picture, uh, we see a lot of easements and let's see if we can just pick out a few here. We see houses in the back, uh, there's an easement I guess on F there, the parcel F, where the driveway is cutting through parcel E, the servient parcel, uh, so that the owner can access their house. And it looks on that same parcel, there's a oil derrick, an oil rig on parcel F. And so maybe there's an easement by the oil company to, to build, maintain a road, and have that uh, oil platform there to extract. And if probably parcel F, the owner of parcel F is getting uh, payments for that type of easement. Um, what else have we got? Bud's Cafe there, that might be an easement. The, the owner of that land might have an easement for that sign. Uh, another individual might have an easement for that sign on that person's land. We see multiple power lines. There'll be easements in gross across all the parcels that they interact with. And I think on the bottom right that says wildlife preserve on parcel G, and that would probably be an example of a conservation easement. So something on the land that restricts it uh, from being developed any further. So you can see there's easements that you just driving uh, would drive by every single day uh, and, and they're just, they're there and they're, they're all around. Moving on uh, in the non-possessory interest bundle of rights, we have something called restrictive covenants. A covenant basically means an agreement on something. And so a restrictive covenant is something that's an agreement not to do. So examples of restrictive covenants which may exist on a property might be requirements to leave a certain amount of the lot undeveloped, called a setback in, in most planning code uh, manuals, or a requirement that you can't install a satellite dish in plain sight or park your boat out front. These are um, 
you see these la- these latter two often in, in things on homeowner associations or HOAs a lot. And these types of restrictive covenants are common a lot in suburb type locations. So in California, especially in, in like uh, Southern California. Restrictive covenants uh, tend to get recorded on deeds for a property, which is sort of like a record of ownership or transfer of ownership. We'll talk a little bit more about deeds later on, but the key point here is that restrictive covenants tend to persist on a property even after it's been bought or sold multiple times. In San Francisco especially, you see some old property records which contain restrictive covenants which aren't enforceable today uh, because state or national laws override these things that were originally written into the property uh, when the buildings were were built. So restrictive covenants, they're private in nature, meaning that they were created by the developer or other party who owned the land at some point. And if laws change to make those covenants illegal uh, against today's laws and regulations, then those laws override any sort of private restrictive covenant that might be on the property. So, um, you know, as we know, the U.S. is a troubling history of, of inequitable treatment of minorities. And San Francisco, 100 years ago, was no exception to that pattern. So sometimes um, if you're in the real estate industry and working in San Francisco, you'll see things in deeds uh, preventing ownership of the property by certain ethnic groups or minorities, particularly uh, in Sunset. Obviously, these are restrictive covenants that are no longer legal and not enforced, but you still, you'll, st- see, you'll still see the old language written on the deeds for, for those properties. Um, Liens are a common type of non-possessory interest. So, actually very common. Um, A mortgage is a lien on a property. So when you borrow money to buy a house, the lender reserves the right to take back the property and sell it on your behalf if you stop making payments on your mortgage. So that process is called foreclosure, and um, in California sometimes it's called a trustee sale. And it will entail the lender selling the property, using the proceeds to pay off any unpaid interest and the remaining balance, and giving you whatever is left, if there's anything left at all. So when a mortgage begins, a lien gets recorded on the property, and that's a a public document registered with the county that says the lender has X dollar amount of claim on the property, and that they have the right to get it back if the borrower ever stops paying. And similarly, you have mechanics liens and property tax liens. If you hire a roofer but don't pay them after the job is complete, for example, they'll have the the right to put a lien on your property, which means that they can sell it on your behalf or uh, just to recover their payment. So any contractor that does work on your property has the ability to put a lien on your property, assuming they're a licensed contractor which is one reason why you want a clear contract beforehand of of what work is to be performed and for how much at the outset, at the beginning. And that'll reduce your financial risk as well as just the risk of of any misunderstandings. So there's a priority structure to liens, meaning that if a property owner is forced to sell their property to pay off liens, there's priority in who gets paid first. It's the same approach as in with like corporate bonds, where there are senior bonds, junior bonds, and then if the company defaults on its debt, the senior bondholders get paid first, the junior bondholders get paid second, if there's anything left to recover at all. Lean priorities, same way uh, for real property, and the first priority is for government-based liens. If a property owner doesn't pay their property taxes, tax lien is created, government will eventually force a sale. Those uh, tax liens have top priority and any other lien holders get paid only after those uh, have all been paid off. And that includes mortgage liens. They're they're second to property taxes. And that's why when you get a mortgage, the lender usually wants to handle the property taxes on your behalf. They'll collect payments and then pay the property tax assessor like uh, using your money but, but they'll handle it. 
Moving on, uh, let's talk about forms of ownership where you can own a property and it's not just you that owns it, but you and a spouse or, or you and a bunch of other investors. These forms of ownership that you see here are instead more common, um, the ones in blue are instead more common for, for investment or commercial properties. And among these, um, you have direct and, and indirect forms of, of ownership. So at the bottom in blue, uh, those are indirect forms of co-ownership. And these forms of ownership are, are most common for large investment properties, like a skyscraper downtown, for example, who's going to be most often held in the form of an LLC or limited liability company. And as you've seen from, from previous classes, like these, these forms limit liability. So that's a big consideration for physical property where there's lots of people involved and, and things can happen. Um, but they're also just more efficient from an administrative and, and legal perspective when you have a lot of investors. One form I'd point out is uh, among these indirect forms um, is the form of a real estate investment trust or REIT because that's an ownership form that's unique to real property. It's a form that uh, allows it to be traded like a stock on public equity markets. And that's nice because it makes it a very liquid investment relative to typical real estate investments where you know you buy a building, it takes a long time to close, you might own it for a long time. If you wanted to sell it, it takes a long time to sell. Um, there's also some tax benefits to REITs that are unique, and so they're taxed at a lower rate or, or even not at all, at least at the corporate level. And so that translates into higher effective dividend yields. And it can be popular among investors, and it's just generally like a great option to get real estate exposure if you don't actually want to own physical real estate. But uh, back on the idea of indirect ownership overall, I think this image kind of visually represents the one step to move, uh, one step removed structure of all these, these instruments. So you have people, individual, so they form uh, their investment into a pool, and that takes the form of a, of a general partnership, a limited partnership, a LLC or a corporation or trust. And then that, that, that entity is what actually invests in the property. Tenancy in common um, happens. It's it's kind of the, the standard form in most cases. So, you know, say you and your partner buy a three unit building in SF, you might own it as a tenants in common. It's usually not used for like big purchases of, of, of really large properties. It, it tends to be more efficient to, to use one of those indirect forms of ownership. But for something like a three unit uh, apartment building, you might see a lot of, of TIC. Um, you might not want to use that structure just given that there's unlimited liability involved, unlike an LLC, but um, many still do hold on to the real estate in this form nonetheless. And a TIC, a uh, tenancy in common, basically splits ownership and each partner is, is free to divest their share or if one dies, that share passes on to that person's descendants. Um, it's basically a standard form of, of ownership interest. Joint tenancy is different. It happens much less often and, and what happens with that is the main difference is that if one partner dies, their share goes to the remaining partners. So it's kind of a unique setup with pretty niche applications. I mean, I my first and really only example is that my first investment property um, was done with my, my mother as a co-owner and we did a joint tenant ownership structure. And in this case, it made sense because we were both owners, but you know, if someday she passes away, her share goes to me, which I would have, you know, had anyway due to inheritance. It's just that this way it bypasses some of the other complications that crop up with inheritance related to um, spouse and siblings and, and all that. We'll talk about the how how real um, how property is passed down in in a subsequent section. And then you have condos too. Condominiums are are also a form of of co ownership. So it's direct uh, co ownership because with a condo. You can you directly own like all the interior space of the condo unit that you bought. Just that specific unit, you own like basically air rights to that to that unit. 
But everything outside of that, all that common area and exterior walls, that's um, all the common area in the condo condominium complex and the exterior walls, that's all equally and indivisibly shared between you and all the other condo owners in the homeowners association. And so that latter part is, is what makes a condo investment a co-ownership setup. So it's kind of a hybrid, um, but it's uh, considered direct ownership. Okay, so here's just a visual example of that. Um, you have an undivided interest you share through, it's in the form of a TIC, all the, the common area stuff. And then you specifically have uh, rights to the interior. You, you own all the stuff on the interior of your unit. So why would you buy in a condo? Um, they tend to be more affordable. You know, it's cheaper to build something like this than three separate individual houses. Uh, sometimes people buy condos for the amenities, like uh, they may have like a pool or, or a sort of a central room where you can, you can hold parties and things. Security, so, you know, downtown SF, it's actually kind of nice if you're in one of those tall buildings. Those are condos, many of those are condos, because you have the security, like if you're away, you just lock your door, it's much, much less likely that you're going to get burgled. And then maintenance is, is another big plus. You, you pay an HOA fee, but you often, you know, you don't have to do the, the yard. You don't have to deal with any sort of exterior maintenance. You just kind of have to maintain the interior of the home. Like you'd have to repair your own dishwasher and stuff like that still with the condo association. And some, you know, it's just, it's the only thing they can get. It's certain locations have lots of condos. So if you want to have a place near Walt Disney World, like, you know, condos, ha there's, um, there's an element to that. So there are some risks, um, noise issues. So as there's usually shared walls, then, you know, there's, there's noise issues, noise transfer. Um, and just as, as being part of the proximity of space, there's less privacy and, and you have, you just generally have more regulations and, and rules that you have to follow with the condo than you do if you just simply have a single family house that's not in an HOA. So you may have like limits on what things you can have on your patio or, or whether you can rent it out. Oftentimes, like my, I have a condo in downtown San Francisco and if I, I, I can't rent it out on Airbnb, like it's, you get fined, I don't know, $200 a night. If you, uh, rent it to anybody for anything less than 60 days for a 60 day rental period. So I can rent it out, but I can only rent it out to long-term San Francisco residents. Can't Airbnb it. So these are common type of things you encounter, uh, if you own a condo. Oh, and, and last but not least, condos are, are managed by a homeowners association. And the way that works is that with the condo, you'll pay a monthly fee. Some of that monthly fee goes to a manager who just kind of handles all the things like maintenance and security and enforcing policies. And so most of the time it's fine. But if you get a bad manager, things in the condominium, uh, think things can go badly pretty quickly. So as a result, um, if you're looking at buying a condo, um, you'll definitely want to check out what's allowed basically and what's not allowed. So the bylaws, the declaration, meetings from uh, the board to see if there's any like major issues or litigation that's going on. Um, they actually usually, you, have, you know, they have to disclose if you're going to buy a condo, the seller has to disclose, disclose any pending litigate, well, any active litigation, you'll just have to investigate uh, for any pending litigation. Um, and then also the budget. So how much money is in the, the pool? The monthly HOA fee that you pay goes into a pool and, and usually gets spent, but it's helpful and um, if, there's, if there's a healthy cash balance in that. So co-ops are like condos, but instead of having ownership of the space inside your condo, you technically have ownership in stock of a company and the company itself owns the entire building in the common area space. 
it's also one step removed. Um, it's effectively the same idea though. So co-ops were an idea that were created before the ownership structure of condominiums were created. And that's why you tend to see co-ops really only in, in re really old cities on the East Coast. So New York City, for example, the buildings, many of them were built long before any condominiums and, and the ownership structures associated with that started popping up. And so those co-ops co are still around. But it's, you don't really see them other than that. And then there's um, ownership by marriage. So these are state specific. So, so one form is what's called an elective share. Uh, this is not really a thing in California. About half the states choose it. Um, this is a very specific set of rules for what happens when um, you know individuals marry and then, and then a spouse dies, what happens to the property after that. For California um, and a few other states, um, you have something called community property. And so what happens when you get married is that half of all property uh, acquired after the marriage has begun is owned by each partner. So it doesn't count property owned before the marriage or any other assets. And, and it doesn't account for, it, do, it doesn't count inheritances like received by you when you were married. Um, but, but it is something that uh, is the case in California if you're married or in a registered domestic partnership. Okay, um, other types of ownership structures. We also have timeshares. Uh, I'm hesitant to really put this into, well, basically you should never think of a timeshare as an investment. You should, you should really think of it as an annual expense. Um, sort of like allocating money to hotel spending money each year. And th there's a big mix in terms of what timeshares are out there uh, as far as the quality um, in terms of how it's maintained, um, how good the management is, and the expenses. Never think of this as a financial investment. Expect to spend thousands of dollars each year uh, on your timeshare um, and expect never to be able to sell it for what you paid for it, if for anything at all. Okay, and there are also water rights. So water rights are an interesting form of, of ownership in, in real property. And uh, a lot of it's very state specific or, or, or very local water. It's a very complex form of uh, ownership. So we won't get into, I mean, we could do a whole class on water rights itself, um, but just know that they're very different and they're very subject to local conditions. Uh, rights to oil, gas, and, and mining, um, a little bit less complex, but, but still kind of a category of its own right. And it's, it tends to vary by state. So, um, generally you own the oil that you drill out of the ground. That's what's called the law of capture. So if I drill it out, you know, it may have come from 10 miles away underneath the surface, but I was able to extract it from my land. And so I have the right to, to have it. Um, that's kind of become more complex with fracking because fracking, you, you drill into the ground, but you do what's called horizontal drilling. And so you end up being able to extract oil very, very far out from the original point of extraction. And so regulation has kind of changed. Um, especially in, in places where fracking is more common. Again, it's kind of, it's a specialized form of, of property ownership. But just to kind of sum up what we talked about, there's, there's real property and there's personal property. And there's the problem of fixtures because we don't, sometimes fixtures can, are kind of in between those two. And that can cause hassles and headaches when, when it comes time to transfer. We've learned that real estate is a bundle of rights. Remember that firewood and, you know, it's, it's, it's either a log or it's the whole bundle. Um, but rights mean uh, exclusive possession. You occupy the property or not. 
uh, enjoyment and, and disposition, meaning you can sell the property. In the bundle, many variations on that, many different ways to sort of sort these logs. You can own it freehold, you can own a leasehold, means you're, you're uh, holding a lease, you're, you're renting. Um, Non-possessory interests, including easements, restrictive covenants and liens, we talked about those. Easements, for example, uh, the road uh, through the timber company to get to my uncle's house, that's an easement. And we talked about ownership. Um, you can have more than one direct owner, like TIC, the most common form of, of ownership. Unless you're talking about indirect ownership, where you have all sorts of things like REITs or LLCs. And then we talked about community property as being a characteristic of ownership in California when you're married or uh, with a registered domestic partner. That's it.